Hollywood's horror-themed documentary mentality could make it easy to dismiss the existence of demons entirely. In their effort to distinguish themselves from the mainstream, most serious investigators report experiencing demonic activity as extremely rare. However, these experiences may manifest differently than what popular culture leads us to believe. In recent years, there's been a growing focus in the paranormal field on demonic lore. More paranormal investigators are pursuing demonology, and many recent TV shows and movies feature demonic hauntings, often prioritizing shock value over providing an engaging narrative. In these shock-driven films, demons are portrayed through children cursing, young girls levitating off their beds, coughing up nails and speaking in unknown tongues, with a hapless priest trying Latin verses and commands to no avail. Tonight, we talk directly with a survivor. Author C.L. Thomas returns and shares her unique insights and experiences with true evil. She has even made this story available in her new book, Dancing with Demons. And that's our topic when we return to the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. I'm Dave Schrader, and this is my Paranormal 60. I'm not gonna stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural. Perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. Hello, my little darklings. We are a day away from Halloween. So tonight, we're bringing the scary. And there's nothing scarier than real-life experiences with overwhelming forces. There's a brand new book that's out and available. We have a link for it in tonight's program guide. Based on the true story, Dancing with Demons, A Paranormal Encounter, by author C.L. Thomas. I was lucky enough to be asked to be a part of this book by writing the foreword, and I am very honored to have that privilege. Growing up and seeing ghosts in a dysfunctional family has been a challenging journey for our guest. Her earliest memory is of an entity standing over her crib. However, unlike most stories from people who've had similar experiences growing up with the paranormal, Ms. Thomas didn't initially fear the spirit realm. It wasn't until she moved into a rental house in Nashville, Tennessee, that she would truly learn to be afraid. This book reflects her personal experience with a demonic-like force during a real haunting in Nashville that forever altered her perspective of the paranormal, plunging her into an endless quest for truth. The opinions in this book and this interview are rooted in personal experiences and a comprehensive examination of the research conducted by other paranormal authors and cases to make sense of the paranormal events that took place during this time in her life. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome back author C.L. Thomas. Good evening, C.L. Thank you for being here. Hi, Dave. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, well, I mean, I wanted to, you know, everybody's bring, asking me to bring the scary just before Halloween. And, uh, you know, aside from just another ghostly tale, knowing you personally and having the opportunity to become friends with you over the last few years uh, has been great. And I can tell when you tell these stories, the thought and the depth that you put into sharing them and just how raw and emotional they truly are. You said one of your earliest memories is that of seeing specters looking over you in your crib. So the paranormal is not something new to you in any way, shape, or form. No, not at all. Not at all. Now, could I ask, prior to this experience, (laughs) what were your thoughts and perspective when people talked about cases of the demonic? Well, you know, in Hollywood, what you see is beds levitating and girls spitting up nails, that kind of thing. And that's right. the image you get in Hollywood. You don't really get what I believe could be, or what I believe is happening with demonic entities. I have to apologize. I'm losing my voice. 
So. That's all right. I, pr- I appreciate you you powering through this for us tonight. So talk to me then about this place. You know, so many people have interesting stories on how they found the haunted location that they they decided to inhabit. Uh, was this place brought to your attention through a certain way or did this just happen through stumbling upon it? I just stumbled upon it. It was a just an ordinary house off of Franklin Pike in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, just an ordinary house that me and an ex-partner had moved into together. There was nothing about this house that said it was haunted at all from the outside. It looked very inviting. It had the big veranda, the old Southern style veranda to it. It was a really cute house. There was just nothing that indicated anything that would unfold when I lived there. When you did the walkthrough, same thing, just very clean and fresh and clear. Yeah, it was very, very clean. And most of the time I could pick up on if a place is haunted. This had no indicator at all. Nothing. So you and your ex-partner move into this location. And how quickly after taking up residency there does something begin to show itself? Um, well, it first started affecting my ex. Um It's very strange. Nothing was going on in our relationship at all. When we first moved in, we had been dating for quite some time and everything was going smooth. And then when he moved into this house, he became very isolated, very abusive, almost. Well, not abusive, but um, violent, I guess. He was kicking things, denting things. I was very angry at just nothing. I could do like the littlest thing and he would just become so angry and hit walls and stuff. And Mm. it just kind of escalated. It happened within maybe two months. He became just a totally different person. Um, Was your partner sensitive at all to the supernatural? He was very, uh, he didn't believe in anything. He doesn't believe in heaven or hell or anything. All right. So this, wasn't like somebody who walked in with a lifelong sensitivity no. that became an easy plug-in for whatever energy was there. Something really had to take grab a hold of him and, and insert yeah. itself into his life. Exactly. He was actually in med school at the time. And, you know, so he's very scientific and doesn't believe mm-hmm. in anything paranormal at all. So unless but it's something that's scientific... He- is- were you able to start sensing that what was taking place wasn't necessarily him and changes from him? Could you, since you are sensitive, could you pick up the fact that there was something influencing him? Not right away. So that took a while. At first I thought, because he was doing clinicals at the time. So I thought, well, maybe it was um, a combination of school and clinicals getting to him. But Mm -hmm. there was one incident that really changed the way everything went down with him. Um, I was in bed and he started screaming. There was a bathroom in the middle hallway. And for some reason he was using that bathroom and he started screaming at something in the hallway, get out, go away. And he saw something. He physically saw something. He wouldn't admit it later to me that he did. Mm -hmm. Like he kind of just brushed it off, but he saw um, a shadow run through that hallway, and that was something we, um, another roommate and I would see quite a bit that became like a really big part of this haunting. But that was the, the changing point. Was he, I mean, did he wake up from a cold sleep to see this thing, or was he watching it as it was moving down the hall towards you? What do you remember about that? I I have no idea, to be honest. I just know I was in bed and he started screaming and I, and I went in there and asked him what's wrong. And he said, I just saw something. I saw a a shadow. I thought it was you running through the hallway and he realized that it wasn't me, but there was some other things too, that was happening. Um, He was very particular about where stuff should be. Like I couldn't leave keys down anywhere. I couldn't put a purse down by the door, that kind of guy. And Stuff started moving around the house, like the keys wouldn't be on the key ring. They would be on the table where I know I didn't leave them there because I know what would happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so stuff was already moving around the house. He was blaming it on me, that kind of thing. And But the shadow incident, that's what really changed things. 
with him because and he became at, at that point he became more vulnerable i'm guessing because yeah. now it wasn't just something that maybe he thought he'd imagine from time to time this was something that was very real and became terrifying yeah, yeah. that's when he became really isolated and angry and um long story short i had to end up asking him to move out and when you when you make that choice again, are you realizing that it's a supernatural force that's that's influencing him, or have you not yet come to that conclusion? I didn't come to that conclusion just yet. I knew something was going on by then, but I just figured, mm -hmm. well, maybe it was again his clinicals. I thought, well, maybe I don't know what I thought at the time. I just don't There's know. Somebody folding under hard. pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Now. Let me ask you, as somebody who actually actively now investigates and, and does work in this field and somebody who is a sensitive, um, why do you think that that some spirits pick on others to kind of infiltrate and, and not somebody else? Why why your partner and, and not you? I think maybe if you look at it from a spiritual standpoint, you in war, for instance, um, if there is a war between evil and good, who are you going to take out first? You're going to take out the most vulnerable and the and the person that has the most influence over a household or whatever it is, right? So, like in war, you're going to go after the captain or 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 some leader or something. I think because he was the dominant one in the house. And he was also, um, he was very vulnerable. I think he was very easy to manipulate and influence. Does that make well, sense? Because he was, yeah. He was so distracted okay. by so many different things, right? Yeah. You've got, you've got the normal stresses and pressure of being in a relationship. Add to that. You're in medical school. You've got all these clinical exams. You've got these tests. Medical school alone can be enough to break somebody. And yeah. I'm not, I'm not making excuses friends for somebody who is obviously aggressive and aggressive towards our guest, but the, you know, there are natural elements to this that could contribute to somebody in this condition. And once you're already kind of eroded is my understanding, it makes it easier for some entities to gain some control. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I believe that 100%. There's so many cases out there that have those indicators when you when you start breaking down a case of who's affected, who's not. So, yeah. And in these cases, when somebody, you know, I mean, we, we hear stories like this all the time, a couple buys their dream home or moves in together and they've had a great relationship up until that moment. And then things begin to change dramatically. One or the other partner becomes more aggressive. They, they start to um, almost change complete personality traits. And to me, that's such a, a, an alarming thing. And I think of how many people, how many couples I've met that were so happy that started that part of their journey and life went upside down. And I've always attributed it to, oh, there's st stress of getting together, stress of moving into a new home, stress of starting <laughs> a new life and finding the place for all your junk and where this is going to be. And that that's enough that can drive most people to drink, right? <laughs> but in yeah. this case, uh, how do we start to differentiate between an, a spiritual or supernatural element being the catalyst as opposed to just normal pressures and stressors? Well, I think um, in this case, I can't speak for all cases, but in this case, the way things unfolded over the next six months, I had a new roommate move in uh, and stuff started happening Again, it, it kind of leveled off a little bit. It was quiet, um, and then it started up again. So I think if it continues and, and builds, and it's a good indicator that you have something spiritual going on. If it's starting to, like if one person's removed from the situation and then it moves on to somebody else, it's a good indicator. So. Do you think it was the kind of the insertion of the new personality that the, you know, that, that started to stir things up because you said it calmed down till the new roommate came aboard. Do you think this energy, this spirit or demon liked having CL Thomas to themselves? I have no idea. I don't know how to answer that question. 
I know this specific property had a lot of stuff going on on it, though. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, do you want me to go into more of? Yeah, please give us some of the history of what you, I know that you're a, a scientist mind and detective and want to start digging into these things. So what did you uncover about the property in the home? Well, the property had a lot going on. So it ended up when my roommate did move in, it started again uh, within just a few weeks. We started seeing the shadows, stuff was moving around the house. Um, it was like a slow build before, kind of like when you watch a tornado, it's like slow and then it builds. Well, we had, um, our house was divided into two apartments, one on each side. And we, it was separated by just a thin wall between us, between us and a neighbor. The neighbor, I met her one time at night and she was going out. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, Wicca or anything like that stirs up energy. Because that's not true. That's not what I'm trying to say here. Right. But she was on her way to some, um, like a St. John's the celebration this was in june she was all dressed up and I, I knew right away that she was going to something like this and she ended up passing away two weeks later so she was obviously into some kind of paranormal or spiritual stuff going on um and i'll tell you later why we found that out um the lady that lived on our property. There was another house right across the, the um, parking lot from us. She too passed away within just not even two weeks after that, that other lady passed mm. away. So it's two people right there back to back. And both of them are pretty strange occurrences. Uh, and both of them too, they didn't have any family relations. They, they were pretty much loners, very similar to my story. Um, one of them had a drinking problem and fell down the stairs. That's how she passed away. And then the other one, we're not quite sure it was some kind of an overdose that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what happened to her. But the more we dug, it seemed like people didn't really last in these properties for very long. And it's just a continual thing. A revolving um, door of tenants going in and out. Right, right. Um, the other thing, too, is that we found out that the property was actually on the front line of the Battle of Nashville. So I could dig in the yard and find it was kind of cool, that aspect of it. But if you think about all the um, death that happened right there on that right. property. The saturation of blood into that earth, the psychic right. scar that would be left behind from the tragedy, the death, the violence must have been mm -hmm. just overwhelming. Yes, Absolutely. There's like a lot of stuff going on in just that little space. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm curious too, you know, when you've got a piece of property that's stigmatized like that with that kind of uh, history, do you think those ever get cleared CL or do they always kind of have this black cloud of despair that hang over them? I don't think it has to be a despair or black cloud. I just think that, I don't know. I think somehow we kind of draw that out. Mm. All right. Well, going forward, you're, you're dealing with this, your new roommate moves in. How quickly after the roommate moves in, does the activity pick up and does it start targeting the new roommate? Uh, she did have a lot of experiences. I don't know if it targeted her specifically. I was um, mm. at this point, I was getting most of the brunt of what was going on. So, oh, really? yeah, and I'll talk about that later. But all right, she started out seeing the shadows, and then she heard an audible voice. As stuff started falling in her bathroom, you know, just moving around, stuff like that, and she just started having experiences that she's never had before. And she got really scared. And this is 10 years ago. So people weren't really talking about the paranormal so much and right. was trying to find some help. And she actually got a priest to come in to do in not an exorcist, but a blessing in the house. She thought that would help. And there was one ghost hunting group that she found that stayed on the property over the weekend and they caught a whole bunch of evps and stuff like class a evps 
And most of them were asking where I was. I was sent away because most of the activity was happening in my room that was sharing the wall with the house next door. And and for thought, listeners that are new to this, when we refer to EVP, electronic voice phenomena, and it's classified a class A, that means it's going to be the highest top grade, very clear, audible, easy to understand piece of audio evidence. So I'm sorry, go ahead, right. Sale. Yeah, so the investigators, they caught a whole lot of EVPs. They caught a shadow actually manifest in the hallway of my bathroom. That's mm. where most of the activity would take place. And... That on the EVPs, it was like the sounds of little kids asking, where's Crystal? Where's Crystal? It was very, very strange. And there was no kids on the property anywhere. Uh, we know that the, the history of the place didn't really have kids that we know of. It was very strange. And we came to the conclusion that just maybe these weren't kids, but demonic entities kind of toying with us a little bit. Okay. But... When yeah. you hear these, I mean, it's one thing to to be in a place, think it might be haunted. You know, you've had experiences, you know, it, but there's always that nagging sense of logic in your brain, right? Trying to make sense of it, root out the what what the real cause is of why you believe this is going on. But now you've got a paranormal team in there that capture this shadow figure coming forth, audio and EVP calling out your name. How does that start to affect and impact you? It really affected me. I didn't know what to, I thought it kind of drew me in, to be honest. I became really caught up with wanting to know more to a point where I was almost obsessed with it. Hmm. I, I just, all I wanted to do was um, run the little recorders and try to communicate with the spirits. It, it consumed me. That's the best way to explain it. It just consumed me. Um, my roommate, she was really scared. She wanted help. The ghost hunters, uh, they weren't really much help. They did find a priest to come in and they did a blessing on the house. And it, it helped for maybe, I don't know, a few weeks. But then the activity came back and it was probably 10 times worse when it did start again after the priest was in there. As though you angered it by calling something right. and trying to banish it. Right. Hmm. And what was the new uptick in activity? What type of things began happening? So I was scratched. Um, and there was a bag that actually, there was a gym bag and it had a bunch of stuff in it, like shampoo. It was a heavy bag. It actually sailed across the room and mm. hit the wall. Um, and it actually, the, the way it did it, it came out of the bathroom again in that same place where all this activity would manifest and the bag actually um, flew across the room. I saw, we would see, I would see like a shrouded figure, a hooded figure that started manifesting. That was probably the most scary entity to see. Would you see any human features to it or just this cloaked, no, it was just a, ominous a dementors look? It was just, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what it looked like. But I think the biggest thing for me was, yeah, I became very isolated and consumed with it, with the energy in the house. Again, um, I began to get really isolated. I became very depressed. It was just all very, I don't really know how, it's hard to talk about, actually. Understandable. Um, the book is out, and we do have a link for it, Dancing with Demons, A Paranormal Encounter. So check today's program guide. And please do me a favor, when you pick up these books, folks, make sure to rate and review them so that they will be seen by more and more people. And remember, it is the season. We only have a few days left of October. Rate and review this program. Whether you're watching it live right now, give it a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe and hit that bell so you never miss another minute of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. And make sure wherever you listen to this podcast, if it has a rate and review availability, please do that for us. Help us out, especially this month, so that we can gain more momentum, more and more people can find the program. We'll be back. We've got more to discuss with our guest, C.L. Thomas, right after this. Hello, my friends. The ninth annual New Jersey Para Unity Expo is here. 
this weekend. The Ghost Hunters, the Ghost Brothers, Adam Barry, Chip Coffee, Chris Smith, Mike Conclaves, Destination Fear, now Project Fear team. Uh, Cody Despiens and Satori Hawes are going to be on site. John Zaffis will be there. I'll be on hand. It's going to be an amazing weekend. So many cool talks, so many cool opportunities to meet your favorite paranormal personalities. Come on out. You can get information at New Jersey Parayunity Expo.com in Woodbridge, New Jersey. You can find more information simply by going to darkness events.com. All right, we're back. C.L. Thomas, our guest, the book, Dancing with Demons, A Paranormal Encounter. I I, I want to be cautious with this next question, C.L., as, as I can see, and the people watching this right now live are seeing that it, even discussing this still impacts you and makes you uncomfortable. I, I'm curious, do you ever worry that by speaking about this, it may garner attention from something again. I do worry about that actually because honestly it's never really left me. Mm. This this haunting's never left me. It's always been in the back of my head. And while writing the book and and kind of going back over these memories, did you notice any kind of uptick in strange activity in your life current day? Yeah. So every time I, I tried to put this book out for the last couple of years and it seemed like every time I almost finished it or wanted to put it out, something major would happen in my life that, and I mean, life changing stuff would happen hmm. to me. Like I went through a tornado. Um, I was in a little car accident kind of thing. Um, had a lot of breakups went through bouts of depression just thinking about all of this so yeah it's been one thing after another over the last few years now a lot of what you're talking about sounds like classic hauntings right ghostly manifestations voices noises footsteps cloaked figures but there seems to be a big jump from normal paranormal style activity to something demonic what began to give you the idea that this was something far beyond just Casper the friendly ghost in your home. I think it was the oppression from it. The house Mm -hmm. felt very, very heavy all the time. And it was just a very depressing feeling when you're in the home. Even other people would pick that up as soon as they would come in, they wouldn't want to come to our house anymore. And just the way that it just consumes people like it did with my ex, it did with me. It was just a different feeling to it. From start to finish, how long did you live in that location? Maybe about eight months. Eight months. Eight months. Two roommates in eight months, or was there more than two? Two roommates in eight months. Okay. All right. What was the, you know... I don't want to get to the crescendo of this yet, but what were some of the other <laughs> mounting points of what what was you know taking place in this home and to you? I mean, was it physically affecting you? Were you feeling medical yes. conditions and issues aside from the depression no. and anxiety? Yes, and I know this is um this is why it's so hard to talk about because I don't want to mm-hmm. say that the paranormal caused what I'm about to say. Um. It did, but it didn't. So we no talk need to about be apologetic. This is your story. Don't worry about how anyone else is going to discern or understand this. I, I open the show up for, for people like you to share their stories, not to worry about what other people are going to think about these stories. They can read the book and judge for themselves. They can measure it against the yardstick of their own experiences, and that's fine. I don't think that there's any one specific answer to any of this, of what's going on. And to one person, what seems like a maelstrom of hell to another just seems like another day at work, right? Uh, And that's not in any way to diminish the experiences you've had. But just because some people don't see it as A, B, or C doesn't mean that it's not still devastating and terrifying. Right. So I don't even know how to start with that question. Long story short, I was very depressed. Um, I was 
not feeling well. I was very isolated in this haunt. This was probably about six months in. I was a completely different person. My personality had changed. I was not the same person. It, my roommate could attest to this. Um, were you aware was, of that change as well? Or, or were you kind of so entrenched it, that you weren't even realizing how drastically you had changed? Yeah, I, I wasn't even realizing it. And I think the uh-oh moment for me was I never yelled at anybody. I, I never mm -hmm. yelled at anyone in my entire life. And I found myself screaming at my roommate for just no reason, which is like anger. It was like a flash of red just went over me. It was just so uncharacteristic that anyone who knows me, I never raise my voice at people ever. So that was like the, so um, this thing. This these are the <laughs> exact same uh, temperaments that were affecting your ex partner. Yes, absolutely. So, I think we so often look for demonic things again, like what Hollywood taught us. But I think it happens a lot different. It, it picks on vices like depression and you know addiction stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's how it works. But for me, the energy was just affecting me so badly um, with the depression and everything. I think it made me physically ill. So what happened was um, I was an avid runner and I would run, you know, 10 miles. It was easy. I would run 10 miles daily just in training. And it got to the point where I couldn't even walk a mile. So I went to the doctor and was diagnosed with stage two cancer and ended up in the hospital for surgery. And my roommate decided that was it. She talked to our landlord and we found another place and she had moved all my, she got all of our friends together and just moved all my stuff out. So when I got out did of the she, hospital. Did she give the landlord any idea of why you wanted to need or why you needed to move out aside from your health issues or, you know, meaning did she go to the, the landlord and say, this place is haunted. We want out. She did. She did actually. And of course he said, you know, he told us some stories that happened on a property before we moved in there. One of them I, I can't really disclose. It's a closed case. I can't disclose what happened there, but mm -hmm. there were some other things that came out that happened in this house before us, hmm. but yeah, he left us move out. He had, he actually had another property and we moved into that one. So it, it worked out, but yeah. So are you surprised that he knew all of this and really didn't disclose it to begin with when you went to move in? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> all right. I mean, by law, I don't think they have to disclose anything, really. I'm not sure. The, some states you do. And that's why I was just curious. You know, it's I would think, hey, if I knew these things had happened and I was well aware that this had gone on in the past, I might give a little heads up to the people <laughs> moving in. But, uh, you know, maybe I guess times are tough. You do what you do to get the rent in the door, right? And again, right, some exactly. people just have no faith or belief in the paranormal and may move in and be absolutely fine and not affected by it. Those that are more sensitive and aware of it may take notice. And it seems that that's what took place with you. So getting out of that place, did your health begin to return quickly? No. So I battled cancer for a couple of years after that, off and on. And you know, it's been an ongoing, like I said, it, that haunting has never quite left me. It's, it's always in the back of my mind, really. So yeah, it's just something that's going to be with me for probably the rest of my life. It's like once something gets a hold of you like that, it doesn't mm -hmm. let go. Have you gone about trying to be exercised or, you know, find ways to try to release its tendrils from you? So I think I've done like a lot of empowerment stuff mm -hmm. just recently in the last couple of years. I really think that we come to a point in life where we have to decide that we're going to move forward and heal ourselves. Right. And I think that a big part of it is stepping up and taking, I mean, no, you can only accept help so much from people and, but you have to stand up at the end of the day and, and pretty much move forward and make the decision. Right. And that's, that's where I'm at. And that's how I, I pretty much healed from it. You've, that opened you up obviously to more elements of the paranormal. Does it make you feel like you're more of a, 
a target or more susceptible to something else attaching to you, leeching off you, affecting you and your energy? It has changed the way I looked at the paranormal. Okay. So growing up with it, I was never really afraid of it, but this changed me in a way that I see it a little differently now. Like I, I really believe that if we're not careful, we can dig stuff up and have stuff attached to us if we're not careful. Okay. And what do you do now to try to make sure that that doesn't happen? I'm very spiritual. So I really look at, I really rely on the spiritual aspects of my life to protect me. Like I work a lot with Angel Michael. Um, I just call on God a lot of times. I rely on just different spiritual part of my life. All right. I, I, we're going to take one more very quick break. Uh, we'll come back. We'll continue our conversation and what the outcome is. What advice does our guest have for people that might be going through something like this and unsure how to proceed or how to diagnose what it exactly is that they're dealing with? We'll, we'll discuss that next right here on the Paranormal 60. Innovation, creation, vitality, and joy are the pulse of MySoulTopia.com with many custom creations for the mind, body, and spirit, along with classes, intuitive sessions, coaching, and healing energies. MySoulTopia.com strives to bring sophistication with a twist to the metaphysical and the holistic market while raising the community's vibration and channeling the new paradigm, which means new and exciting adventures for all. MySoulTopia.com is utopia for your soul. Visit MySoulTopia.com, your one-stop shop for all your metaphysical needs. Offering hand-selected crystals and crystal jewelry with prices to fit every budget. MySoulTopia.com offers the best selections of tarot and divination cards by top designers. Expertly curated and award-winning book collections with top authors on every subject you'll need on your spiritual journey. My Soultopia is also proud to offer the finest singing bowls and an eclectic collection of the most amazing gemstones, crystals, and crystal jewelry from the top metaphysical designers in the world. MySoultopia.com is always your one-stop shop for award-winning mixes of Florida water, sage spray, and other spiritual protection. So begin your journey with the best resource, MySoulTopia.com. That's MySoulTopia.com. Why mess with the rest when you can start with the best? MySoulTopia.com. Again, that's M-Y-S-O-U-L-T-O-P-I-A.com. The book we're discussing, Dancing with Demons, A Paranormal Encounter, and a lot of this is is featured in the book in much more detail, much more prominently. Uh, I, we want you to read the book to get the full narration, the full gist of the story. Uh, also, not my goal to rake my friend over the coals about these past uh, dealings, but I wanted to have her share these concepts because it is easy to be more dismissive of the narrative of demons if there are not more horrific things taking place. Uh, you know, my, my bigger scale thoughts on this is, you know, when you have a demon, there's not little games they play over long periods of time. They, But then you have somebody like CL who felt the erosion and it wasn't all at once. And it just slowly broke her down, broke her, her relationships down, the people's lives around her down, all the way down to her own health before this happened. Um, if there are people out there right now, CL, that are going through this and cannot discern whether it's a haunting or something demonic, what are some of the clues uh, that you would tell them to be more cognizant of? Well, first of all, you know, see if you can make sure you learn how to decipher what is yours and what isn't yours as far as emotions and energy. I would start there. And, you know, separate yourself from 
whatever energy is in the house from what you would normally be. Um, I don't know. Well, do you, because I, you know, I, I know you don't want people to go into a panic mode and be worried about every mm-hmm. rat fart in their house being a sign of something demonic. Right. But it, it just seems right. like, you know, I know there's no clear delineation line and that there's different levels of, you know, infestation, oppression and possession that take place. Do you ever felt that you got to the point of possession or at least the beginning of a possession? No, I don't think I was possessed. I think it was going down that road, possibly, but I think it was more of of oppression with the way that haunting went. It was certainly moving down that road to where if I didn't take control, that it could have spiraled down that path for sure. Right. And had your friend not stepped up and seen the damage that this place was doing to you. All right. Yes. Um, you've you've witnessed ghosts and have seen these things. Does it make you more acutely aware of darker forces now when you go to haunted locations or you're just out and about and you go into a restaurant or bar? Do you sense darkness now? Sometimes, yeah. I think once you see something like that, you never on see it. It's one of those cases. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I've become more in tuned on negative energy versus light energy for sure Uh, prisons are always a big one and some of the ghost towns that i've walked in or places like that anywhere where there's like a lot of angry energy this kind of hanging around let me ask you as, as your friend is it a good idea to continue to walk these streets and visit these places knowing that there is a vulnerability within you probably not Probably not. And I, and I hope you understand. In no way am I trying to shame or guilt you, but uh, you know, it's interesting that people will have these horrific experiences. Yet it doesn't seem to turn them away from continuing their journey. Are you doing it more in a sense of education and enlightenment, or is it more of a sense of trying to show the powers that exist that you're not afraid? I think it's a little bit of both. And I think that I'm just trying to educate myself a little bit on how to help other people who might be experiencing the same thing. There's a whole long list of cases out there just like this one mm-hmm. where if the, that negative entity, I don't want to call it demonic or whatever. I just call it negative. But how many cases have you come across that are just like this where there's a negative entity that's completely oppressing one person in the helm, you know, and how do you help that person? So not to. And that's the million dollar question, right? Is what do we do? How do we know? And what, what actually works? You know, I, like you, I have a deep rooted faith and, and lean deep into that faith and into prayer to try to help where I can. Uh, People out there that are not in that place, they're not in a, a comfort with any kind of form of, you know, belief system. Your, your ex wasn't, and it was imp- impacting and affecting him, whether he believed or not, which is kind of a really telling, almost terrifying aspect of this, isn't it? It is absolutely. Yes. But I mean, there are cases out there like that though, where people who are just on suspecting and mm-hmm. like, you look at, for instance, the Hans Holzer case with the Tyler family or that, that family in Tyler where the son, I think his oh, name the devil in Texas. Yeah. Yes. That case on you, it was on your show actually where that boy, Andy was just affected. I mean, he wasn't looking for the paranormal. That family wasn't. And no, and it's a, it, for those of you that haven't seen it, it and it's the episode of the Holzer files is called the devil in Texas watch it. It is one of the more chilling stories and just watching the erosion of this family and how it impacted and affected them and the wild array of activity that took place from notes that would port out of the air and mm-hmm. land in front of them to phone calls that would come on disconnected phones and they would turn off, the, the father would sleep in the room with the son to protect him at night. They would turn off the light and they would hear what sounded like a thousand bugs falling on them 
he would leap up and turn on the light and the room would be coated in dead bugs, not just dead bugs, dead dried bugs that you could touch that would be reduced to, to dust in seconds. Horrifying elements that, that really seemed to be in play to do nothing more than destroy your psyche, your heart and, and your spirituality. And in the end, in that case, it won out and the, the young man uh, ended up taking his own life. When you were doing the research for this book and you were evaluating and looking at some of these cases, was there one that really stood out to you that you found the most surprising? Yeah, the Hans Holzer one, for sure. The way that, I mean, because that entity affected that Andy for years, uh, well mm -hmm. into adulthood. Um, There's other cases too, though. One, it's a lady, it was one of the television shows. I can't remember which one, but there was a lady who worked in a haunted hotel and ended up taking something home with her. And that entity affected her where she ended up getting cancer. That's what led me to start writing this book. Her story is so much shadowed mine. Um, she ended up, she had a haunting that affected her relationships at home, her family life, the whole deal. And then she ended up um, getting stage three cancer, I think it was. And she was very suicidal from it. Very, it was a case that was very much shadowed mine. But in my research, there's another one too in California that I want to talk about. And it's a- Can I, um, let me let me ask you one question before we leap to that, just because I know this is the question on the minds of our listeners around the world. And I know uh, as you listen as well to this show, um, how, how do we correlate- demonic activity turning into cancer what do you think is taking place that causes that kind of physical breakdown or mutation is it because of the interference of that being is literally mutating what you are i think in a sense yes it's it's an energy thing so you think about um everything's energy and you have mm -hmm dark entity that I'm in this is like a one of those fine lines that I don't want to cross I'm not saying that the paranormal can cause cancer, cancer or depression right, or right. like that. I'm not that's not what I'm saying I, I think right. in specific cases though it has a hand in it you know just all this stress oh and it. I agree I agree and it, it, if there is a lower level entity uh it can undoubtedly impact people that are on a depression scale. And especially if they're in a, in a low swing and they're dealing with that, you are so easy to feed off of. Uh, exactly. and, and if you, if you don't believe that folks, uh, you know, that there are people in your lives that they see you when you're, if you're at your lowest and instead of offering you a hand up, they're the ones that seem to grind their heel into you and look how that is. That's the human element seeing you and, and breaking you. There are energies, there are beings, whatever you want to refer to them as, that, you know, want to hurt you as well. So I, I get what you're saying. It doesn't necessarily, it's the chicken and the egg thing, right? It's not necessarily <laughs> did yeah. the depression cause the demonic attachment or did the demonic attachment cause the demon? We're not sure where one comes and the other goes, but we do know that people like you and I that, you know, dance with demons, dance in the dark and have to deal with depression can be an easier target for a lower energy form to affect. Mm -hmm. And when you look at these cases too, you look at um, just the socioeconomics of it. These people usually come from abusive homes, poverty, um, just all kinds of things like that. So mm -hmm. there is a correlation between all of this stuff. It's kind of frightening when you think about it because post COVID world, the whole world is pretty, economically shaken up, right? Even the the wealthy have had to reevaluate the way things are in their lives because things are so desperately different now. And it makes you wonder just what kind of maelstrom of uh, hell is waiting for so many people that are, are still slowly going down that, that, you know, like, I, like you, it's hard to say these things because I don't want to implant <laughs> thoughts, but but you do wonder, you know, I mean, if it, if it is going to be, you know, so many people dealing with this anger, anxiety, and anguish, um, how many more people are going to be targeted? 
Probably a now, lot. You, you were mentioning another case in California, so please take take over from there. I kind of lost my train of thought of where I was going with that, but one of the cases I did last year, it was um, this lady who owns an almond orchard, and it's actually haunted. You go there and you see shadows running around the orchard. It's a very strange place, but when I did her interview, she had she was on her third husband. Her third hus husband was in hospice, and she actually lost three children um, throughout the years that she believed this haunting was going on. And it just it, the numbers three alone, you know, kept showing up. But long story short, she lost a lot of people in her life to this entity, and was caught up in a, that depression. It was just continuing years and years with that. But and I lost my train how, with that. How, how, no, that's right. How forthcoming were these people to talk with you about their cases and, and about their stories? Was it easy or was it like painful memories of any sort to try to have to re, revisit? She, this specific case, she was very... You can tell it was really affecting her. She, I never played the interview. I have it on recording, but she was crying when she was telling me all this stuff. You know, she's at a place where she just didn't know what to do. Um, yeah, it, it's very hard with her. When you reviewed the, the recordings from these interviews, were you ever uh, surprised by electronic voice phenomena being recorded during the interview process? Not in that specific case, but I did get a lot of um, recordings in the house. It's it's interesting because the outside of the house had a complete different haunting to it than inside the house. So inside, it was more what she was drawing to herself. But outside, it was more of like a land elemental kind of thing going on. It was really interesting. But she was for, for again newer listeners. How do you def uh, what what's the definition for you on an elemental being or an, an energy? What does that entail? For me, it was more. You, I couldn't really communicate with it, so it was definitely inhuman. So that's how I can pick up. It's kind of an intuitive thing, I guess. But yeah, it was just something connected to the land. Little weird. Shad like you would see them, little weird shadows running around the orchard field and stuff. It was almost sounds like the imps that Chris Fleming talks about, uh, <laughs> yeah, quite often, right? Like that. And it, I've never came in contact with anything like that ever. And then that happened, it was the strangest thing. But usually, if it's a human entity, you can tell if it's male or female, you can almost commu communicate with that entity. This, no, there was no. You could just see like little things running around. It was very strange. I can't even Fascinating. begin to say Right, yeah. <laughs> and there's there's many different cases, many different aspects of the story that, that uh, CL talks about in the book. Again, we have a link for it in today's program guide, Dancing with Demons, a Paranormal Encounter. CL Thomas, the author, our guest this evening. Thank you so much for coming in and being open about this. I know it's not easy. It's scary to have to revisit those elements of who you are and what you've lost. And, th you know, just thank you. I, I know that's going to reach to a lot of people that are in that same kind of situation right now. Thank you for having me. Always, always a, a pleasure speaking with you. And I look forward to our next adventure out in the world in the uh, paranormal realm. So we will talk to you again soon and happy Halloween. We're here. It's the season. Is there truly a thinning of the veil? Is there something surrounding us that's gaining strength and power? Sometimes it seems that way as we look at the world on the whole. With wars breaking out and horrific shooting incidences everywhere from schools to parks to bowling alleys, parties, and more. There's no doubt that there's a darkness that has a good lock on this land. But I don't believe that that is going to be the end of humanity or the end of the world as we see it. We're a resilient race. We are people that see the good, that see the bright, that see opportunities. And I hope that in your journeys, when you stumble upon these moments and you start to feel overwhelmed, 
you take heed and step back from those experiences, step back from those places or people. Sometimes it's harder than others, but it needs to be done to protect yourself, to protect the loved ones around you and protect your home, your spirit, your mind. There's no shame in the game of stepping back and taking care of yourself. And you could see the effect on our guest tonight as she recounted some of the tales. And I wouldn't push to go deeply into it. That's what the book is there for, for you to read and understand a little bit more, give her an opportunity to have already spilled her heart and soul out onto those pages. But I ask that where you go from this point forward, you lift your head and walk in a place of strength, in a place of positivity. I ask that you don't walk in a place of fear. And it's harder now more than ever because of speaking of more epidemics possibly going across our planet this next year, economic woes, wars, civil unrest with another presidential situation coming up over the next year. But don't be defined by those dark moments. Continue to push forward, move onward and upward. Our, our civilization has risen and collapsed more times than a Jenga board at the Schrader home on a Saturday night. And we will find a way back through the darkness. And I hope that you will continue to look for that light yourself. Thank you for making me part of your journey. And thank you for allowing us with the Paranormal 60 and our network of friends here to entertain you, educate you, and enlighten you to different thoughts and concepts, to different belief systems and stories from around the world. And may your journey be a little bit safer because of the information that you learn here. Thank you and have a great night. And to all, happy Halloween. Thank you.